As humans, we have a tendency of constantly trying to reach into the unexplored and breaking new horizons. If you've been to the cinema recently, you might have seen gigantic alien worms swimming through sand dunes. Or if you're into books, you might have read the Jules Verne's tale of a team of explorers trying to reach the center of the Earth. While that is the common imaginary, a lot of scenarios that have been depicted in science fiction are still far from reality today. So in real life, we're left to still gaze at submarines, rocket ships, and other flying objects as new groundbreaking innovations. Even though the methods that make them possible have been around for quite some time now. Not many people realize that one of the barriers that was unbroken until recently is moving non-destructively and in multiple directions through solid particles, like sand dunes, heaps of grain, and bulk powders, or just like the content of this box here. Now, the problem with breaking your horizons is that you usually reach a point where existing methods and technologies don't work. And even though we keep on fine-tuning and improving them, they might have reached as far as they can go. And hence, a new scientific breakthrough is required to go beyond. Now, if looking back into the history of humankind, we have a lot of popular examples. For instance, if you've read the Greek story of Odysseus, uh, the Greek warrior who spent years trying to travel back home by sea simply because the winds wouldn't turn the right way, you would know that there was a time when travel by ship required the use of a rectangular sail, and that sail needed a wind to come from behind the direction that one was trying to move into. A revolution in travel by sea happened when people realized that a triangular sail could move against the wind. Likewise, planes and human flight wouldn't have been possible the way they are today if physicists hadn't realized that a narrow fall shape, like that of plane wings, moving against a fluid like air would experience a lift. Now, considering that, we can do things like visualizing single atoms, creating vaccines, and building microscopy structures, surely we must have a method to move through a surface like this, right? Well, let's look at what people have tried, shall we? So, um, over the years, teams of researchers in the US, China, and across the world put together some of the brightest minds in the fields of robotics, physics, and geotechnical engineering. And they tried to build robots that would use flapping veins to move through. A bit like a fishes do at times, or what we do when we go swimming. The concept is you push back and you get a reaction force moving you forward. Did this work? Well, it didn't work, or at least this type of uh, systems couldn't really move when fully submerged below the surface. So other people tried to delve even deeper into bio-inspired robotics, using ondulatory motion to move uh, through. Did this work? Well, it didn't work either. So what other um, living beings do we know that can move uh, underground? What about worms? Worms use what we call peristaltic motion, which means alternating the extension and contraction of different parts of the body to move forward. So people built robots trying to use this type of mechanism. And uh, did this one work? That's right, it didn't work either. So the only method that uh, was known to work in granite materials was the use of a screw type of mechanism or drilling system. 
And while these methods work to some extent, uh, they're usually quite destructive, usually requiring the removal of the matter in front of the direction that you're trying to move into. And also, they're limited to movement in a single direction. However, moving in a single direction is not particularly useful if you're trying to move uh, in a system as unstable as granular materials. Unless you can have an external structure outside the granular material that can make sure that that device keeps on following the right part, like you would have in a drilling rig. So people try to build uh, robots that would propel themselves through granular media without the requirement of an external structure. And we're unsuccessful as well. So if we go back a few years, I was uh, doing my PhD at the University of Edinburgh in uh, lovely Scotland, where I've been for over 10 years now. And if any of you have been through a PhD, it is usually a pretty frustrating time, uh, to be honest. Uh, you usually start with the expectation that you're going to revolutionize the world of science, but because you're trying to do something that hasn't been done before, you usually get to year two or three where you realize that you're going to be lucky if even a single person beyond uh, your examiners and your supervisors is going to read your thesis. Because let's be honest, we're talking about the kind of thing that even one's mom is not going to read. I was lucky enough, though, to be working uh, in a field that I was passionate about since a young age. Ball pits and playing with sand, or what physicists would call granular materials. Granular materials are anything from sand to grains to powders, or even the matter that forms the rings of Saturn. It is any system that is made of solid discrete particles that most interact through contact forces. So the particles are either in contact, hence there is a force between them, or they're not in contact, hence there is no force. I also used to be fascinated by how um, a lot of French mathematicians in the 1800s would uh, come up with the most brilliant theories, either while being stuck in bed for long periods of time or while being in the bathroom. And I always thought I was more of the bathroom type, but so it happened that I was uh, bedridden, as they would say in the olden times, and uh, I was inspired. I was inspired by a paper that I had, uh, a scientific paper that I had read the previous day, which described one of the previous attempts that I mentioned earlier of trying to move through granular media. And specifically, this paper told about the type of forces experienced by an object being pushed through these type of systems and the flow of matter around it. And I started thinking. I started thinking about whether there would be a better way to move through, one that would be feasible in practice. So I had an idea. I set up some computer simulations and some experiments at home. And uh, to my biggest surprise, it worked. Not for the reasons that I was expecting, but it worked. What you're seeing right now is the world's first subterranean drone. And because there is an award in the dictionary to describe what it does. We came up with a word for it. We call it a crover. A crover is made possible by a physical effect which I discovered back then, an effect which we recently started calling the crover effect. What I discovered back then in essence, is that there is a coupling between rotational and translational motion in granular materials, which in simple terms means that if you're rotating any object in this type of materials, even a symmetric object, like a sphere or a cylinder, 
about a center of geometry, that object will move through as a simple result of that rotation. So you have a cool technology that no one knows about, and uh, what do you do? Do you go the Nikola Tesla way and uh, let uh, some opportunistic entrepreneur take most of the fame uh, and money from it? Or do you patent the hell out of it? <laughs> and considering that I grew up in Rome and I wasn't too fond of pigeons and of option one, uh, let's just say that you know, we, we went more for option two. Um, so then the next question was, you know, where do we even start? What do we do with this cool technology out of all the multiple possibilities that it can enable? So we set up a company. We called it Crover as well. We started building an amazing team. And we decided to focus on the issue that we felt would have the biggest uh, social and environmental impact in the short to medium term that of helping grain storage operators maintain the quality of their stock. The reason why we decided to focus on grain storage is that it is still today the single phase with the highest post-harvest losses before consumption. With more than 630 million tons of grain lost every year during the storage phase alone. Mass and quality losses during grain storage are also account for about 6% of total greenhouse gas, of, of, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from food waste. The way grain storage management is done at the moment is also very labor intensive, usually requiring people to physically walk on top of the grain bulk which is not only very tiring and time-consuming, but it is also very dangerous, since if you sink into the grain a bit like quicksand, there's nothing that can save you. Over the years, there has also been a growing uh, uh, regulatory pressure to move away from the traditional way of doing things, which is fumigating grain regularly, towards what people call integrated pest management practices which means keeping an accurate eye on the condition of your grain and maintaining proactively their condition. This is because, uh, for many reasons, including the fact that there have been uh, um, legal limitations being imposed on the number of uh, fumigants that can be used during grain storage, with only phosphines and CO2 being allowed in the UK and Europe by now, as well as the fact that a lot of fungi and uh, insect species are becoming resistant to this type of chemicals and uh, a push from consumers towards chemical-free solutions. So we equipped the Crover with temperature and moisture sensors so that it measures these two parameters as it swims through the bulk of the grain and building a 3D map of conditions within the bulk. The Crover Robo also mixes the grain as it moves through, which helps maintain their quality without having to take the grain out of storage. Our team is working really hard on making sure that every single grain that enters a silo or a shed exits it with the same quality. And we're also trying to make sure that grain storage operators and farmers don't have to put their life at risk simply for the fact that um, they don't have any other option to manage their grain storage operations. So um, we, this is just the first version of the Crover Robo. We have a lot of other features in store, with the plan being to eventually provide a complete grain storage management solution. But we don't want to stop there. A crover can move through any type of granular media, 
with motion tests already being, having been carried out in a wide variety of granular materials, from silica sand to pellets to oil seed, uh, um, cocoa beans, and more. If we think back about the possibilities that um, seemingly simple discoveries, like the fact that a narrow foil shape could enable planes to fly, or the fact that a triangular shape can move against the wind. If we think about the impact that they had on transportation and society, we can't help but wonder how far the Crover could take us all. So, just to give you some examples, future potential applications of the Crover include uh, underground uh, sampling uh, and exploration on Mars and other planets, recovering buried objects, uh, traveling to desert sand, assessing the content of mineral bulks, and helping in the mixing of chemical powders. The underground barrier is broken, and the journey has begun. Now that we know how to get there, the question for everyone is, what would you want to do if you also had your own Crover that could boldly take you there, where no robo has gone before.